everyone and welcome to the Jeff Fuller Show. Today I have with me Scott Lee, who is the guru behind Guru. Um, Scott uh, is from originally from Korea. He s managed to be inspired by many people around him um, who helped him with his education. He managed to sneak his way into Columbia, he told me, and we're going to dive a little bit more into that. <laughs> And we're going to actually find out more about how we got to start Guru, which is a personalized tutor matching service and online education. And for me, that's very close to my heart because my original degree and was in teaching. I became a high school teacher. I taught for about five or six years and thought that I could do something more with my life. That It really wasn't something that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, for various reasons, but today we're still teaching, but in a very different way. And uh, mm -hmm. so welcome to the show, Scott. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, I look forward to hearing more about your journey. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Scott, let's go back to, I suppose, what inspired you to start Guru. Um, and, but let's step back to, I suppose, your, you grew up in Korea, South Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you were surrounded by some fantastic people. So tell us a little bit about how this all started. Yeah, so, you know, I came here, I came to the U.S. when I was in high school and I wasn't able to speak English that fluently. And so definitely a lot of my friends and teachers helped me significantly for me to even uh, be adjusted into the culture and, you know, study it for those many subjects and do different sports. Um, so I think it all, you know, started from like founding peer, peer tutoring club at my school because it was really, really out of nowhere. When I first arrived in my school, it was called Avon Old Farms and it's Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, as you can tell, the school name Old Farms, Avon Old Farms. I'm like, what kind of school name is Old Farms? <laughs> but it's okay. You know, I, I, it's a wonderful school. But literally, like when I first arrived, like GPS was like disconnected. I'm like, oh my God, it's like no ending forest. So big, you know, because in you know, Korea is a small country. I mean, it's not, I don't want to, I don't want to say bad things about my, I love my country, but it's very small and compared to Australia or United States. So the school size was humongous. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and so um, my point is, it's very hard to find tutors for if you're like struggling with specific subjects like in korea there are tons of tutoring centers and tutors all around the city and so i found it peer tutoring club that was really impactful because i was finally able to give back to my friends who helped me a lot in terms of math and science and when i go back to korea you know i wanted to volunteer for those underserved children because i was very fortunate to study in the u.s and it was very hard to find the website that connects between underserved children and English volunteers. So I found it peer tutor um, like website in Korea. And I, I was very uh, impacting me a lot. I reached out to a lot of like centers who need uh, volunteers. I contacted a lot of college students. So I think it really impacted my life throughout college. And even after I came back, came back from the army. And so, you know, it's really, uh, you know, education and unlocking students potential has been my passion. And so after I graduated from Columbia, I briefly worked at JP Morgan, quickly realized that, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. So I started grew a um, little less than six years now. So really time flies, definitely. So let's go back to, uh, you said that, um, you managed to sneak your way into Columbia University, <laughs> and the, and the term we used to, in our, our preliminary discussion before we hit the record button was that yeah. you uh, you have lived life by winging it. So how did you get into Columbia? What's the story behind that? You know, I was very very fortunate. I think at the time when I was in high school, I thought I was very smart. You know, blah blah blah. But when I, you know study at Columbia, there's so many smarter and much more talented students than me. And so when I look back, I was like, yeah, you know, of course I got into Columbia. But if I look back, I'm so fortunate to have amazing teachers who supported me, wrote me a great recommendations. And a lot of my friends supported me, be, supported me to be a class president. It was just, 
I think at the time I was like, oh yeah, I've studied so hard. I put so much effort. I deserve to go to Columbia. But at, at, you know, I think it's I'm it's ninety five percent luck. You know, especially uh, looking back, I had to serve in the army for two years in Korea. I lived with eighteen soldiers in one room, and it's all from all over the place in different backgrounds. And you know, I look back, I was like, wow, they're so they work so hard, they're so brilliant. But the fact that because I, you know, my family supported me to come to the U.S., I'm so fortunate. And that's what I learned throughout my life. I think it's not just about the hard work, dedication, motivation. It's a lot of work, a lot of luck. And that's why I think you have to feel like you're very fortunate. Uh, you have to give back to the community. If you have an opportunity to share your knowledge, you should do that. And really love your neighbors because at the end, you're so for, you're so much more fortunate than you think. Mm. And I definitely I am. Mm. Yeah, that's it's um, very true. Um, we sometimes forget uh, how lucky we are to be born in a certain country, um, to be at born access to schools, to have clean water, um, and there, you've got no choice where you show up as a human being, and um, and the people that will surround you. And I think um, we should not t we should be very grateful every day, and that's certainly what I am. I'm very grateful to have been born in mm -hmm. Australia and to. Uh, a fantastic family and a mother beautiful and country. Yep. Mm. So um, it for me, it's been grateful every day that um, luck and opportunity have met, and then seizing it with both hands, and then learning from life, and then making a difference. I love an insight by Wayne Dwyer that said, uh, uh, "A journey in life is to actually teach yourself, teach others, and raise the energy mm. of the planet." And I so agree with that. I completely agree, Jeff. You know, my grandparents escaped from North Korea. My father lived with six siblings in one small room. His goal was to eat three meals. We are so poor. Korea was very, 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 it's, it was disaster after the Korean War. And imagine I was born in North Korea. I just didn't even have a chance, you know, to dream something big. You know, I think um, the grandparents, they, they thought that we would be reunited because we were one country for many thousands of years. And he, they left even their first son to the one's relative's house. And they tried to find him. And I think he's, he passed away. Right. Basically, I wasn't even able to born or, um, you know, they, the, they have to serve 10 years in the army. You know, their average lifespan is like 50 something. A lot of people suffer in North Korea. Um, I, you know, the fact that the audience here who can speak English and understand English is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I think we really forget about that. Um, I think, you know, so uh, I think appreciate every day, as you mentioned, and everything is a learning opportunity. You know, I teach uh, six kids, students, six to eight students on Sunday during church service and i learned so much from them i think you just have to be open-minded every every everything is a learning opportunity and you know i think uh, human interaction is so precious and i think we realized that after COVID happened so mm -hmm. yeah uh, i to yeah totally agree and um <coughs> the uh COVID is really also always highlighting the things that are important to us as human beings. It's um, you know community, uh, it's connection, it's conversation, it's health, um, it's travel. We haven't been able to travel. I miss that a lot. Uh, mm. But on the other hand, I've done a lot of local travel and I've got to know my own country a lot better. So, mm. um, so I'm you know I think now I could almost be qualified as an Australian tourist guide because I. I'm, <laughs> So, um, so let's get back to um, what was the original inspiration. So you you had a lot of people that helped you and guided you and were mentors to you to help you with your education, and you saw an opportunity. So, what was the initial inspiration? Then was a, a, for Guru. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So you know, when I came back from the army, you know, I didn't speak English for two years in the mountain, living in a mountain in Korea. I didn't study for two years, so my brain was very, like, it's frozen, you know? It's like, oh, wow. And th those Columbia kids are so smart. They're like, oh, my gosh. 
And so I was like panicking. So I was like, oh, I need a tutor. I was looking for a tutor, going through a crack list. And it was so hard to find. I was so shocked because there's so many talented, intelligent people in the U.S. And still the tutoring, it's so difficult. To, it's so, so much inefficient than I thought compared to Korea or other Asian countries. So, okay, there is a market that, you know, Uber, I love marketplace connecting people. So at the time I was, I think, too, too bold. Uh, I didn't know I was ignorant. So I was too, 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 too overly confident. So I was like, okay, you know, let's build an app. It's Uber for tutors. Oh, it, it, it won't be that hard. Definitely a big mistake at the time. <laughs> I, I think I should have been more, much more prepared. I was like, oh yeah, Uber for tutors. Oh, let's do it. And I was like, okay, oh, let's quit JP Morgan. Don't tell my mom for six months because she'll be very <laughs> upset. <laughs> my mom loves me working. Of course, you know, she's a Korean mom. She's like, oh, I love you working at JP Morgan. It's a great, we took a picture in the entrance. I'm like, oh, she's very proud. I want you to stay there for many years. And I just, you know, I was like, oh, no, it's, this is not my, where I belong. So, well, that's, well, that's the yeah. quickest, quick aside on that, isn't it? So, especially in Asia, it's, you're supposed to get a safe job, work there for the rest of your life, retire and die. Is that sort of the, is that the sort of uh, the sort of more Asian approach to life? You've got to get that safe job, doctor, lawyer, work at investment bank. Is that true? I mean, it's, I don't want to generalize, but I think, you know, in, in just my mom's perspective, my father has been an entrepreneur. He's a risk taker. Definitely. He's a, he's okay. a businessman. He, he, he's, like very very inspired he, he inspires me a lot he's my mentor and he always took so much risk and my mom had to live with that so I mean, she doesn't want to do it again with her own son you know so yeah. maybe that's why i don't want to generalize the general public i think more people are um you know taking more risk and become mm -hmm. entrepreneurs but definitely my mom was like oh you know i just you know don't you know, just live don't too much headache too much risk so just like oh you know be, be be happy you know but you know i think happiness is true to yourself right you know listen to your heart and so for me uh staying at jp morgan that i don't belong to which i'm not i'm not saying the court all the corporate jobs are bad it's just that i'm not born that way mm -hmm. and i think i've noticed that after the army i started niche uh, online re or like fashion e-commerce, e which I not, you know, as you know, I, I don't know, audience can see, but I'm wearing a great t-shirt for almost over a year now during COVID. <laughs> so definitely not a I hope you, I hope you, I hope you washed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so some, some people ask me that and I have multiple of great t-shirts, so don't worry, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think, yeah, you, you just have to, I, I will probably mention this more, but self-actualization, asking questions about yourself, who you are, what you're passionate about. I think early on, I think that's so important. And I think that's a really big missing piece pieces in current education system. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree with you. I think uh, we teach people a lot of information, but we don't teach them life skills. We don't, uh, mm. we, we don't help people, I think, create a habit of lifetime learning. Um, and mm -hmm. you're, you're right too, I think, Certainly, one of my missions is to help people um, find their path, and mm. then and then act on it, um, and then teach others about it. I think there's um, too much. We we we're coming from a very industrial world, moving into a very fast moving and changing mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurial world. There's, there are so many people that want to do side hustles. Um, in fact, the numbers in the U.S. apparently. Uh, I think 40% of Americans actually have a side hustle, whether it's a, another job. Mm. <clears throat> so it's, it's really interesting, but I totally agree with you. I, as a teacher myself, one of the big challenges I saw was the curriculum was created by people that had never left school. They're called professors. Mm. Yep. They work for the higher education systems and they'd never left school. They'd never had a real wow. job. And I went, so a lot, I felt a lot of what we were teaching was irrelevant or um, yep. not necessary. And I would have my students say to me all the time, Mr. Bullis, mm. why are we learning this and saying, because you have to, right? Not because you, it's mm. a good idea. 
Um, yeah. Of course. Um, so actually self actualization is an important thing to understand and that's part of life's journey. I, I do agree with you. I can't agree more. I think, you know, um, it's a jungle, right? This, this is, and the school seems like a very zoo, very safe, you know, it's a curry, you know, I think that, um, we have to be more open-minded and, and I completely agree. I think that, um, it's, this is the, the system is built in during industrial revolution. It's like a one size fit all system mm -hmm. where it's just creating labor force. And it's not, it's not, I do believe all students are masterpieces. They have amazing potential. And I feel like sometimes society is telling them to, you know, you're a B student, you're a C student, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, they're limiting their amazing potential. And I think that's a, that's a tragedy. You know, I think that, you know, we should not limit their potential, limit their talent. Mm -hmm. And some people might think it's too ideal, but it's not. You know, I think we have to start asking those questions about yourselves, what, who you are. And that, that's extremely important. But sometimes, you know, a lot of some teachers joining us as a team members or guru tutors, and it's almost impossible in public school systems in a lot of schools because they have to manage 20, 30, 40 students. And as you mentioned, it's like, you're just like controlling the riot. It's like this, this it's hard to give, pay attention to each student. It's almost impossible. So, uh, and a lot of teachers are underpaid. They're not treating that, treating, they're oftentimes not treated with respect and it's really hard. And so I think it's really, instead of us focusing on some matters that is less important. The education is so important. It's for the future of generations. Mm -hmm. And we really have to seriously think about, it, especially next five, 10 years, it will be evolving so quickly, quickly and AI will replace so many jobs. I think we really have to focus what only human can do, like empathy, creativity, and a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so this is a time, I think during, and after COVID, it will even, it will, it will happen even more quickly. And so we really have to care about this matter. And I think we cannot push back more because mm. it's so imminent now. Yeah. I, I think that's something we'll, I'll talk a little bit further. I'm going to raise this again, the future of education. I think I'd love to mm -hmm. explore that a bit more, but let's, um, let's move on to, yeah, okay. So you left JP Morgan. Yep. You have leapt into the jungle. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you fund all this? Like you're, you're in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. that's not a, that's not a cheap city to live in. It's expensive. Um, so how did you go from working at JP Morgan, uh, to, you know, funding your life to grow the business and how to get started? Yeah. I mean, you know, I just, I have to be very transparent. You know, we bootstrapped initially. I, I had some saving with, you know, stocks and all that. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. My father was very supportive. My family, he's an entrepreneur. Um, he has businesses in the U.S. and Korea. So we had a, you know, initial like support when we bootstrapped. And, you know, I'm very fortunate because I think it would have been very, very hard for me to fundraise with nothing. You know, I'm a first time founder. I'm just overly confident. And I never had a tech experience. You know, I had literally just only thing I had was confidence. I think that's it. And I can do it. Um, but, you know, I think I was very fortunate and they kicked, kicked it off and I met wonderful people initially. And, you know, we had a prototype, we built an app and made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. If I lay it down, it will be over, over a day. So it's not enough time for me to lay it all down. But, you know, I was very fortunate and some uh, initially it's very interesting. Like some of them are ones I met at JP Morgan and, you know, they, they helped me, they introduced some people and some of them are initial parents. We help them tutoring and, you know, though they become our NJ investors. We had over 40 investors in first round, which is a lot. It's very unheard of. Not many people have wow. that many people in the cap table, but 
I I follow back. I met so many wonderful people all around the world. Even we have investors in Peru, Brazil, Guatemala, like Europe, like all over the world. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that means we have amazing supporters, and they have a ma- you know, amazing network of people who can support us to grow. And so, I'm very, very thankful. I'm very, very fortunate to meet them. But initially, it was very difficult. Obviously, I got like hundreds, probably thousands of notes. But you know, as an entrepreneur, that's an that's okay. You know, it's 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 a way to get to where you wanted to be. If you really believe in your vision, which I never really thought initially. Now it's much more mature, and because I learned so much from a lot of parents and students and teachers. But I think if you're really I think persistency is extremely important, and and luck too, right? Mm. <laughs> well, opportunity meets luck. I think you've got to be prepared for that. And that comes down to yeah. ha- having a vision, and I think having the skill and also the innate ability. There's a, a Japanese uh, word or a guy behind it called ikigai, which is uh, I don't know if I pronounce that correctly, but essentially the you know what you should be doing your path is the intersection of both your experience, your innate ability, and your passion. Um, mm-hmm. And that shows up at the core. And I, I certainly do very much agree with you that as humans, we are uh, all got a gift or gifts. Uh, we're all unique. And mm. it's our, our journey, our you know, mission in life is to find what your mission is. I think that really mm. is um, as humans. And we're innately creative. Um, mm. And I, I certainly believe that uh, we facilitating that to help people find their path is uh, very exciting and facilitate that is, is, is a very exciting mission and looks like you're doing that. So let's get to, so you bootstrapped, how long before you're going, I need more money uh, to do this seriously and how far into your journey was that? Um, I never heard of it. Like at the time, like everybody was talking about VCs, like venture capitals. Like, okay, you know, oh, it seems like I need to raise from VC. At the time, no idea what VCs are, who they are, how they think, you know. And so I was like, I was trying. I reached out to a bunch of VCs. Of course, they all say no. Like, who are you? You know, they're like, oh. So I was like, okay, I, I, almost immediately, I think after six months, a year, I start trying to raise, but I just got all no's. So I was like, okay. And they're like, oh, one of them, I think one of them told me or something, like I need to raise from friends and family round first. I'm like, okay, oh, let's do that. And then that's why I, you know, I went to that uh, check size, like from 10K, like friends and family. And I'm so thankful. I mean, at the time, they're just, we're so early and they're, I don't know why they ended up investing. Honestly, I'm think I'm, I'm working very hard because they trusted me and our company, our vision. But yeah, I think immediately after six months, a year, like I tried to raise, I got all no's from VCs, long story short, and raised from friends and family from JP Morgan's, literally everyone that I know. Like I reached out to all the people, LinkedIn messaged them. Some of them invested from cold LinkedIn. Actually, by the way, um, I, I got a full-time offer from JP Morgan from LinkedIn message. So LinkedIn message, everyone is very, very powerful, really powerful, but you have to just send like 800, 900,000, <laughs> but it's okay. You know, yeah. you just have to, there's no right answer. If you think about it, okay. There's no, there, if, you, if you're working at the company, you're working at one company at a time. It's like a marriage, right? You're not marrying to like 10 wives. You're marrying one wife, you know, like, one, I mean, investors, there are many of them, but at the end, you, you can be very creative. There's no right answer for job. Like I, in the U S especially, like, I don't know about Australia. It's very hard to get a job from just applying, you know, because some people will have referrals and referrals are so powerful and, you know, you want your resume at the top. And so, you know, I think reaching out to uh, LinkedIn or like intros extremely important i think networking that's what i actually learned in my senior year at college while i'm doing job interviews and got a job i eventually fortunately got a job from jp morgan was the networking branching out intros you know connecting with people and i think that skill is extremely important and mm-hmm. so uh, as a result i, I don't want to talk like on and on but 
job recruiting at JP Morgan, like, like, you know, call emailing, call, like LinkedIn messaging. It was extremely helpful for me to fundraise. It was a similar dynamic, actually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So obviously persistence is very important. In your life, any yeah. life, of course. I think yeah. I think that's a key. If you think about it, athlete, right? Like NBA, I, I, I'm watching a lot of NBA games suddenly recently. At the end, you know, of course, they're very talented. They have a great like height. You know, they're very tall. You know, but at the end, you have to throw like many, many times. So when you're in a tough situation, clutch shots, you can you can shoot, and you're confident about it. Mm. I think life is similar too. You have to be very consistent. You have to be very persistent. And so when the moment comes, as you mentioned, the opportunity arrives, you can capture it. Yeah. I, I remember talking to um, Melody Perkins, one of the founders of Canva, which is now a oh, um, cool. multi-billion dollar company. So, and she told oh, me. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> I didn't know that. So Canva is an Australian startup that is now oh. uh, well and truly a unicorn. I don't know what its valuation is. I think it's five to $10 billion. Um, that an idea to take on Adobe in terms of uh, you know creating a easy to use um, you know Photoshop version basically, and uh, I do remember talking to her and she said that when she went and approached venture capital, she got a lot of no's as well, and uh, she said that she did forty different versions of the slide deck before she actually got anyone to wow. uh, invest. So uh, I don't know how many uh, versions of the slide deck you did after the friends and family around. And I, I totally get that too. Like um, I'm a director on the, of a company called Shuttle Rock, which is an, a New Zealand startup. And I do remember that the initial investment um, for that company starting 10 years ago was friends and family. Um, and now we do have venture capitalists involved. So... Uh, but persistence is very, very important. And just showing up every day and taking one step every day. And life is a journey of many steps. And uh, it starts with one step. That's really important. So you've raised money from friends and family. So what was the first venture capital fund or venture capitalist that um, you were able to bring on board? In the second round, it was a price round. It was led by Hana Ventures. So at that, at the time, we have traction. You know, we had great products and tech team. We were a lot more mature than when we raised the first round. So, you know, we we're able to onboard VCs, but you know, I, what I wanted, what I wanted to say is um, it's this, this current world, I feel like VCs are very fantasized. It's very hyped. Mm -hmm. But the thing is at the end, VC invest, I don't want to downgrade them. Or they're amazing people. They're very talented. They're really important for startup ecosystems. But bears basically, they're like, um, you know, they report to LPs. You know, they just make decisions like, a, you know, stock, you know, it's like the equity research people, which it's, you know, I have to, I think startup founders have to think, okay. You know, because sometimes founders often think that, okay, how much I raise means, you know, the success, metrics of the success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. No. You know, it's, you don't, you work so hard for your startup. And sometimes you don't want to give up your company mm -hmm. to reach people. You're basically going back to where you don't want it to be. A begging you know? bill. I mean, you know, I don't want it to mm. say rough words but i think you just i think it's this this startup because it's so overly high fantasize about right. this vc yeah. investor and i i just don't think there's nothing too special about it. Yeah. and so i think we you don't want to do a bad deals obviously and i think you don't want to rush things because sometimes if you're not part of market fit as you think but you package in a way like way that it it it, it is i think a lot of times that happens all the time and so I think it's, you know, oftentimes you raise so much money, you have to move too quickly. And like school, right? It has steps. Hmm. You need, life is like that, right? It has steps. You, you, if you skip the steps, there's always a problem. Hmm. It happens in the country. It happens historically. That happens so many times. And so 
I think you just have to ask yourself really honestly, you know, are you, are you too greedy to take this too much money? You know, because it's, it's a lot of times I think you think that is accomplishment because there's no metrics to show usually. And a lot of times you want to raise as quickly as possible to reach where you want it to be. But if you're really true to yourself again and true to your mission, I think, you know, I think you know better when to raise, how much to raise, how much you want to give up. I think that's that's very, very important. And I think we want to build really um, strong foundation mm -hmm. for the company. Um, you know, um, for me, especially, it's uh, honestly, it's not about the money. Initially, yes, you know, I wanted to like IPO really fast. You know, I want to be a billionaire, you know, but at the end, especially education technology company, you're socially responsible for millions of students. And as, as an education technology company, you, sh you have to devote yourself how you can really help and impact students' lives and help them as much as possible. Mm. And so I think at this moment, you know, I think we definitely have a much better direction, great team, very talented team. I'm very thankful for and and so yeah i think we're in a much better position yeah i think you've got to be very careful who you get in bed with um because they could... <laughs> <laughs> uh, i've heard horror stories yeah. from you know venture capitalists oh, yeah. coming in and uh, the owner that's done the blood sweat and tears um loses control and ends up with nothing i've heard a few horror mm -hmm. stories that way um so i don't know if you can reveal it or not um how many students and how many tutors do you have currently? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been helping like thousands of families and, you know, we have amazing instructors. We've been in relationship with many, many years. You know, now after COVID, the virtual learning has been a norm. So we focus a lot, a lot of metro cities, but now we're in all over the states. Even we have Chinese students and we have office in Shanghai and Jakarta. We have a pretty big team in Jakarta. We, they're very, very talented in this fast growing country. And so, you know, hopefully one day in Australia and I will visit you and you can you know, give me some tour. I would love that. You know, I, I can give you a tour. <laughs> it, it might involve some rooftop bars, you know, look over at <laughs> Sydney Harbour. I love that. <laughs> so what is guru doing today i notice we talked a little bit about it you've uh, you've got personalized tutoring where you match you know the tutor with the student um you've got i think i've noticed a new product you've launched called guru live um and you did mention another product so what are the sort of services that guru is doing today yeah so you know during COVID, 1.2 lear billion learners has been affected i think it's been a big problem globally and so you know tutoring it's amazing. We wanted to make it more affordable. We want to add more values through it, technology, but still it can uh, only serve certain you know, families who can afford tutoring. So we wanted to launch group courses, which has a lot of amazing courses, not just academics, but also personal development um, and very, very interesting topic like chess, you know, music, singing and cooking and all that. And so, you know, with $9.99, you get unlimited access to all those courses. And now we are one step going above. Uh, we are launching group clubs, which will be like extracurriculum activity for K-12 students with engagement and project-based learning. And, you know, so it can really help them to unlock their potential. So I think, you know, we're definitely, again, we're in a great direction. I think we wanted to be innovative. We wanted to really think outside of the box that school cannot do it because a lot of times the extracurriculum activities are limited based on the neighborhoods and based on where your school are at. So, you know, we wanted, especially Asian, Asian schools are very not focused on extracurriculum activities. And then I think it's extremely important, especially in the future. And so, you know, we are focusing a lot on how to really help them to unlock their potential and, again, find out what they're passionate about. Okay, so I think this is a great segue then to for us to have a little look and what your I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is the future of education. Um, we've we sort of touched on it. 
um, you know, there's technology now like Zoom, there's, you know, these uh, big online courses, the universities. Um, so what do you think is the future of education over the next 10 years? How do you see it? How is it going to change? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, a lot of, um, you know, education still focus on memorization um, and a lot of hmm. non-practical information. And at the end, the future of education will focus a lot on independent, critical thinking mindset of you know, students because it's going to be life, lifelong learning. Uh, your job can be replaced anytime. Your major can be gone while you're at college. I'm, I, I'm going a little bit more radical and extreme, but it's possible because AI, the pace of the AI development will be so fast that it, it will be evolved more quickly than we can possibly think. And so you have to keep learning. You have to keep thinking creative. You, you have to be really creative, unique in a way that AI cannot replace your job and what you do. And human, because AI is basically, is if and no, you know, it's a pattern, it's information, you know, they keep learning, but they're not creative. And so only human, that's why humans so amazing. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we are masterpieces. And so you, the future of education will be focusing on those quality of how we can be, live up to our potential. It will be even, it will be so critical because society cannot be paying them monthly stipend for those who don't have jobs it, it that's not the that's not the good solution it will make it really toxic because we as a human are feel accomplishment by doing and mm -hmm. you know by living our lives and it's not just by getting money and getting the support which is needed for you know uh, people but not for like you know, when you're twenties and thirties, you know, that, that and how long will we be living? We'll be living up to hundred. That will result higher crime rate. It's going to be, I think it's not good for whole some for society. And so I think we really have to think again, what is really education will do for our future of generations. And we really have to start thinking now. Yeah. So we need to make sure that people have meaning and that doesn't come from just getting a I suppose a monthly wage provided by a government or whatever. Uh, we've all, as humans, got to be doing something, and I think, um, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, and trying to find out what you should be doing is quite often. You know, we all go on that journey, and we make many changes. I think the number of jobs people now have is six to seven in their lifetime. It used to be one. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so how do you? How do you think you help students find out what they should be doing? In other words, you, we talked about self-actualization. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you think you can find uh, your path as a human being? Because I'm sure you think about mm -hmm. this a lot as, as an educa online educator. Yeah, one-on-one -on -one learning is really very ideal because you can ask about your learning styles. You know, you can really observe how each student learns and have build relationship and inspire them you know we really wanted to match tutors and students have who have common hobbies and common interests so that they can be connected they can be really follow like you know the mentor guru but i think you know through the group clubs which it will be more project based and which will have an amazing like forum and a lot of different ways to interact better, but still very affordable and accessible. So I think, as you, as you mentioned, asking right questions, you know, ask about who you are, what kind of passion you have. I think asking those questions and have them built in the database so that parents are also aware how your kids are learning. Because a lot of time parents, if you think about it, we're not getting enough education about how to be a great parent. And it's, they make a lot of mistakes because it's not their fault too, because it's their first time raising their kids too. And they've never been parents before, right? right? So um, I think also educating parents how to, uh, what kind of learner your, kid, your kids are, because a lot of times they're mistaken because, you know, we're not perfect. We have a limited information and knowledge too. And so I think communicating well to parents about their students, about their kids, and everybody on the same page will be critical. 
And I think that's a huge problem also for schools and parents. It's very, very disconnected. Only thing they tell them is grades and when they have problems and it's not continuous. And so I think there are many different ways we can work on. I think, again, it's one step at a time, you know, uh, but definitely I think we should be focusing on that for mm. the future of education, yeah. So let's have a little um, dive into uh, styles of learning and modalities. So you must cover this all the time. So you said that it's important for, for the parents to know um, what style of education, what modalities their, their children need. Tell us a bit what you've discovered um, over the last six, seven years about learning styles and, and learning modalities. I think uh, we just have to realize that every student learn differently. You know, I'm very visual learner, you know, I experimental learner, as you know, I'm an entrepreneur. So I fail a lot, learn from that. And so I think that's why, as I mentioned, one size fit all system, some students get C's and D's. They shouldn't be discouraged because it doesn't mean that they're a bad student. Maybe the learning style, the one size fit all system is not good fit, or you know those subjects might not be of interest to them. That's not their fault, and I think we should let them know that it's not your. It, it might not be your fault, and we have to give encourage them. That's and because sometimes if they got C's and D's in math in, in the beginning, they just hate math, and they just quit. And what's really unfortunate thing about it is that they can be an amazing software engineer, they can be an amazing astronaut, they can be amazing in something that needs a foundation of math. And so I think um, it's tricky because schools resources are limited. Teachers, you know, they you you're a teacher for four yeah. or five years. Yep. You 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 are you're underpaid. You know, you don't, and sometimes you burn out in three, uh, an average, they burn out in four or five years. Hmm. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you are so passionate in the beginning, but later you're so burned out, you know, hmm. you don't have energy to pour to the students hmm. and you, you know, and you have families too, after four or five years, you're married, you have kids, like it's just unrealistic. So hmm. I think a tech company like us to think above and beyond helping those students to find their learning styles, how we can really unlock their potential. Um, yeah. 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 I looked at teachers that were, uh, you know, in their mid forties and I thought they, I looked at them and they looked burnt out. They looked, they'd lost their passion. They were just showing up. And I said to myself, I mm -hmm. didn't want to be one of those teachers. Um, so yeah. So, um, what's the future for guru then? Um, as I mentioned, I think, you know, our mission is to reimagine education and unlock every student's potential. And at the same time, after COVID, we're seriously thinking more about how to make education more accessible. And so I think our goal is to help each individual student uh, through technology. But again, I mentioned this to our team, we are education technology company, not technology education company. So we really have to focus what will be the future of education, how we can help our students above and beyond and be very innovative and creative. And we always remember our beginning of our journey where when we onboarded, one teacher was so difficult. We put flyers in the bathrooms and the walls so that they can know about us. Uh, I went to so many different apartments in New York like, hello, I'm Scott. And you, know, you have to remember that. Um, I don't know, uh, I will become like Canva, like $5 billion, $10 billion company. I'm not so sure. Hope so. I probably, our investors will love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's all about students. It's all about supporting them, unlocking their potential, realizing that they're your amazing masterpiece. And I wanted to be remembered like mm. the company who really, really, really supported and they can, our students can live up to their potential. I think that's a great mission is to uh, help 
students realise that they are a masterpiece and uh, your job as an education technology company is to help them realise that potential. I think that's just such a fabulous mission. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing it unfold. You're obviously moving beyond the tutor matching service into more uh, reimagining education, um, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. One last question I'd like to ask is, so technology is just a tool to educate and inspire and, yes. and guide. So what sort of um, technology are you using currently to provide uh, education? Oh, I mean, we use artificial intelligence for the matching algorithm. You know, um, just to be honest, I, and my major was on engineering, but you know, this technology is built by our tech team and mainly Ramon, our CTO. He is very experienced, very intellectual guy. I learned a lot from him technically in many different aspects. So I think he will be a better person. He's like Steve Wozniak to me, you know, Ramon, he's, a, <laughs> he's an awesome guy. So, you know, um, I don't want to pretend that I know the technology. He's the brain behind it. And same thing with education. You know, we have amazing, um, you know, in, 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 like instructional coordinator, teachers in our team who's behind the scene. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes startup founders pretend or they just maybe wanted to show off that they're doing it but for me and I, I have to be very honest and because it's all about our team who's really working on our mission and move forward and I'm just so fortunate to be around them well thank you very much Scott for actually sharing your story it's uh, inspirational um, and I love that your mission to help people become the masterpiece they deserve to be. And I think every human should become a masterpiece. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, the journey of Guru and yourself in realizing that dream and that vision. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Jen. appreciate it.